welcome to the Ramatheum module. Now, the uh, Ramatheum, funny enough, uh, Ramesses II is not my favourite pharaoh. You may have noticed I've made one or two disparaging remarks about his carving style. But this is one of my favourite sites. Um, there's a lot to it. Uh, so what I want to go over is the first pylon, blockyard, you know me and blockyard, the first court, uh, the poem, Ozymandias, uh, second pylon, second court, hypostyle court, graffiti, sanctuaries, and the magazine storage areas. So let's start. Well, no, before we start, as you enter the temple, you, you come down um, a little road, and just before you go in the entrance, there is a mud brick temple just beside the Ramesseum, um, which is currently being excavated. This is in uh, spring 2011. Um, and this belongs to Amenhotep II. Uh, you, you can't see m a massive amount of it, but you can see things like pylons and ramps. So that's worth having a wee peep at as you come into the temple. Between that and the Ramesseum itself is uh, the Jackal Avenue that they are also just discovering. Um, and they've put up a, a nice reconstruction of one of the jackals, which is really, really nice. Um, and this Jackal Avenue sort of went all round the temple, sort of like going round like this three sides. Um, and also what I want you to do is to compare this. We've already looked at Meren Patel. We're going to look at Setsi the first. So I want you to compare the uh, temples. Um, the layout, the plan, is the same, but they, they are vastly different temples, as you will see. So here's our little jackal. Isn't he sweet? Um, that these uh, jackals have got a sort of kindly, almost benign, smiley face. Um, they're really, really nice. Um, Pharaoh in between the paws um, being protected. And as I say, this went all three sides as a processional way round the Ramesseum. So here's the plan of the Ramesseum. You can see it's a bit more than Merin Patar but the same standard layout. First pylon, first court, second pylon, second court. We've got three ramps going up. Uh, we've got the hyperstar hall here. We've got the sanctuary. Well, smaller hyperstar halls there, and then the sanctuary there. But look at this extensive area around here. Now, this is where all the goodies of the temple were stored. Um, it's also sort of where it, it was a small town, so they had to have a lot of stuff there. There's cooking area. Um, there's supposed to be a school here that Christian Leblanc, who's excavating here, is, uh, has found. They found some schoolboy exercises. Um, so, you know, very, very extensive. And in case you're wondering what that bit in red down there is, um, this was used in the third intermediate period as a burial site. Um, the, the people of that period liked to bury themselves on sacred sites. And could you get more sacred, more part of the remembered past than Ramesses II? I'm sure they knew as much about him as we do and thought he was a really, really cool guy. This is a 3D view. Um, now, you notice that we have the Temple Palace here, all our magazine storage areas here, open courtyard, open courtyard, hyperstyle sanctuaries. But look here, just by the side, you've got another little temple there. And that's the Amenhotep the third, uh, second uh, temple that I was talking about. And also by the side here, we have a temple dedicated to his mother and his wife. Uh, Ramses actually did this quite a few times, dedicated something to his wife. So, um, and, and he gave her a lovely tomb as well. So, it was, yeah, not bad as a husband, I suppose. So, as you walk in, this is the view you get. Because you're coming in at the side. And it, it's a very sort of classic view. 
Um, you've got the, the fired statues of the second court there. It's looking nicely ruined and romantic. You've got the Theban Hills in the background there. Um, it's a gorgeous place, really lovely. So, Blockyard. Yes, good old Blockyard. Um, now, I, I don't know if you noticed on some of these Blockyards that we've got things standing up um, away from the ground. Now, this is because there is a, a lot of groundwater in Egypt. What happened when they built the Aswan Dam was that it meant that farmers could have more than one crop a year. So the way they do this is they flood irrigate the fields. And unfortunately, this has meant that the groundwater has risen and risen and risen. And now these temples, instead of being bone dry for a third of the year, have always got their feet in water and it's doing a lot of damage to the the stone. Um, you know, sandstone is turning back to sand. So they actually have to try and keep some of the more damaged blocks away from the groundwater. So that's why you see them put on these um, uh, sort of areas. They're called mastabas. Um, and they're, they're sort of platforms or beds for the for the stone, and sometimes they'll even be propped up as well. So in the blockyard, you can see um, Arabian horses, the camp of the Egyptians before the Battle of Kadesh, and the contents of the camp. So here is the camp. The camp was surrounded by a row of shields, and that went all round all four sides. And then within the camp, you've got panniers, and you've got folds of linen, and you've got sacks of corn, and you've got a jug of wine. And Isn't it wonderful? You can see it all quite clearly. And here are some of the soldiers with their spears. Now, the, the actual place this block belongs is the back of the first pylon very very high up so you can get an awful crick in your neck trying to spot all this and if the sun's not in the right place it's really quite tricky but having a look round the blockyard you can see it quite easily you can also see um, some horses there now instead of having straight muzzles they have slight dish to them and I was told by a horsey person that this is an indication of an Arab horse so um, that's quite interesting as well, isn't it? So this is the back of the first pylon. Um, it's quite ruined. Um, this part here is all missing. And those where those blocks belong is in that area here. The uh, front gate there has been blocked up. They did it in 1994. And I, I have some very old photos that I took that show it empty. Now, they did this just before there was a major earthquake here because they were very worried about the stability of the pylon, so that was just in time. Um, but as you can see, it is in, uh, it needs some TLC, it really does. And, and you see at the bottom where I was talking about this rising groundwater, can you see the damage it's doing along there? Well, they've come up with this ground, a dewatering project that is just being implemented at the moment. And we're very mo much hoping that this is going to save the temples along the West Bank because they really are suffering from the groundwater. So the Battle of Kadesh on the first pylon. Um, oh, Ramses was so proud of this Battle of Kadesh. And he put it up everywhere he could. And it's in several places in this temple. So on the back of the first pylon, we've got the ring of shields going round. Uh, we've got the camp itself, and we've got the spies. Now, if you're lucky, um, during uh, your visit there, the guardians will let you climb up inside the pylon. Um, I'm never quite sure whether they're allowed to or they're not allowed to. It's not closed off. Um, so see if they'll let you. Um, and if they do, pay them a little bit of back. It's not a massive amount, say between five and ten Egyptian pounds. So here we've got the Syrian fortresses. Do you see there's the captive Syrians there? 
and can you see there you've got the fortresses now as he went round on his campaigning he was picking up um, various sort of fortresses and making them part of his empire and that's what he's showing here I think there's 15 of them in total they're not all on, on the back of the wall now but there were 15 of them that he captured um, and it, that he proudly shows himself doing so now here is the camp you remember I said those shields go all the way round um, and there you've got some more logistics of the camp going on and people preparing things and, and uh, you know, all the things that would happen in an army camp. Um, and here you can see a bit more detail. You can see them, um, I, I think they might be making dinner there. Um, and there's some food sacks and um, the, the uh, horses being looked after. Uh, if you get it in the right light, and it's best to go there in the afternoon to be able to see this particular wall, um, then you can really spend quite a lot of time, but you do need some binoculars to see some of the higher bits. Now, the Battle of Kadesh uh, carries on in the second pylon, in the second court. And uh, Ramses had about 20,000 men in four divisions, which were named after the four gods. And he came across to spies. And uh, they captured them and uh, sort of said to them, you know, tell us all you know. Uh, are the Hittites in place at Kadesh? And the two Shushu uh, Bedouin spies said, Oh, no, no, the Hittites are off fighting. Um, Kadesh is empty at the moment. You go along there now and you could capture it really easily. Now, Ramses at this time was quite a young man, impetuous, bit teenage sort of hormones. And he was like, yeah, let's go. Um, so they went. Um, and the four divisions were now strung out in quite a long line. Um, and they came across two more spies, and this time they took um, some sticks to them and got a little bit more information out of them and found out that the Hittites, yes, you guessed it, they were at Kadesh and they were waiting for the Egyptians. So the first division arrives at the battle and sees the uh, Hittites all there and goes on the run. Uh, the second division comes along, has a little bit of sporadic fighting, um, and, you know, it looks as though all is over. But, of course, we've forgotten we've got Ramses here, so Ramses said, wow, Armand had, uh, you know, given him strength, and he went into battle, and personally, all by himself, wrapped the entire Hittite army. Um, he neglects to mention that the Ra, uh, the Patar and Seth divisions had made it by this time and might have had a uh, hand in the battle and that the Vizier had rallied one of the two divisions that had run away so we had three divisions um, with him. But did he save the day? Because what is the result of the battle. Well, he says he won. Uh, the Hittites tell a different story, that they held the city and uh, Ramses left. So I think at best it could be described as a draw. So here we have Ramses sitting on the throne. This is the back of the pylon. You see him sitting there. And he's got all his flunkies bending over and saying, oh, Ramses, what a clever man you are. Yes, that's a really good idea. Why are we going to battle against the Hittites and string out our army? Um, and uh, he, he, it's, it's a war council, but he's definitely calling the shots. And here we have the spies, the, the second lot of spies that were beaten. And you see the sticks in the hands of the uh, Egyptians beating these two spies and say, please, please don't beat me. Oh, right, we'll tell everything. 
Now, if you do manage to ascend the pylon, you will get this view. Um, and what you can see is the fallen statue that Shelley made the poem about. So what we've got here is the feet there. This is the sort of back of the legs. Um, this is the elbows there and the head there. And that's the second pylon there. And you've got the Theban Hills behind with the pyramid shaped mountain there. So this is this is the view that you will get, which you, you can see is quite magnificent. Now, Shelley wrote this a poem about this fallen statue, um, Ozymandias. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. There's a few things wrong with this poem. And if you think about it, what you saw in that previous picture, and what is said here is not correct. So here is the torso lying down. So think about the previous picture, the, the picture that you can see here, and now think about that poem. Well, what's wrong with it? Two vast and trunkless legs. Well, we had the twitchy toes, but we didn't see any legs, did we? And was it in a desert? Was it half sunk? Um, did we see shattered visages and frowns and so forth? Um, nothing besides remains on the sand, desert, boundless and bed. No, there's a flaming great big temple right in the middle here. And there's trees growing as well. So what's going on here? Why is it this poem so incorrect? The clue is in the first land. He didn't go there. It was just people gossiping about the place. Shelley himself never visited. So um, he was just, it was, it's just Traveller's Report. You know, he met some bloke in a coffee shop and he said, oh, you know, Egypt, really interesting. And he wrote the poem. Now, here is a line drawing of the Kadesh battle on the back of the second pylon. Um, and it, it, it's in two halves. It's a, not a brilliant line drawing. Um, you, you've got the river Orontes going there, and you've got Ramses in his chariot there. Um, you see how the reins go back to his waist, and the bow and arrow um, is, because of Egyptian art, the line of the bow can't be in front of him, because he's too important. So it's somehow round the back of his neck, which is an impossible position to fire from. And um, that... This is how he's supposed to be steering the um, horses. Now, this, this is shown in quite a few things. Um, nobles' tombs. Um, th there's an example in the Luxor Museum. Um, so uh, they must have done it somehow like this. But I'm, I'm not sure, you know, exactly how effective a, a method of controlling horses it would be you get have to get somebody trying to reproduce it who had extremely good waist muscles um, and knowledge of horses to see if that really worked. So there we are. We've got Ramses saving the day, um, and this is the chaos of the Hittite army. Now the Hittites kept their reserves on the other side of the river Orontes. So here they all are standing looking at the battle and there is the fortress of Kadesh up there um, and um, just down here uh, it's not terribly easy to see on this line drawing but they're, they're uh, 
actually holding the Prince of Aleppo upside down because he fell in the water and they're shaking the water out of him. So this is what you can see on the back of the second pylon. A, a bit of craning of your neck, remembering this line drawing to pick out the various bits and pieces. Um, and it, it's just behind these Osiris statues here. A bit tricky to get a photo of because you can't get the distance because the Osiris statues are in, in um, uh, the middle of the picture. But um, that, that's the location. So line drawing and that location, and you should be able to see it. And the, the, the um, fortress is just behind that side statue there. Now, also in that second court, we've got some statuary. Now, some of it was taken by our old friend Giovanni Belzoni. Remember him? And he um, took a lot of stuff back. Um, which is in the British Museum. And if you go in the British Museum, you will find some big statues of Ramses that Giovanni brought back um, from here. But he did leave some stuff behind, including this rather nice black granite head, which every tourist has to have their photo taken with. And um, you can sort of set it up so you look as though you're kissing him. Well, it has to be done, doesn't it? Now, the back of the third pylon, we have a number of gods. And it's uh, one of my little tricks is to, when I'm taking people there, is make them try and identify the gods. Um, now, I have mentioned about falcon-headed gods and um, how you can tell from their insignia which falcon-headed god you've got. So here we have a falcon-headed god. And he has double feathers and he has sun disc. Okay, this is Monchu. This one I'm sure you all know, Thoth. Here's Ramses in front of Armin, Mut and Konsu. And when, when, when you're there, you can actually see that there is a moon crescent just under this moon disc. Up the top there we've got Ptah, mummy form god, and then here we've got arm and min, penis out and his arm up. There's a female here, I don't know who it is because the glyphs are missing and her head is missing, but I suspect it's probably Sekhmet to, or Hathor to fit with Ptah going along there. So those are all the gods that are on the back of that third pylon. So you can have a lot of fun trying to identify them in yourself as you're going around. So here in the Hyperstar Hall, for example, we have Ptah and Sekhmet. Um, Ptah is holding the scepters for life, power and stability. Sekhmet is one of the uh, sort of got the aspect of the daughters of Ra. So she has a sun desk on her head. Um, and she's wearing a very pretty and very uh, impossible to move in dress. Here we have, now don't jump to conclusions, Armin, Mut, and we have Konsu as a falcon. So we have his moon crescent and his full moon. So be careful with your falcon headed gods. And here, just to show you uh, a falcon head with just a sun disc, we have Ra and we have Anubis here. Now, at the back of the third pylon, we've got another battle. Um, when we go on to the module to talk about Seti One Temple, you'll see the difference in the inscriptions that Seti puts up and Ramses puts up. Ramses puts them all up about what he's done and where. He's been successful and Ramses, Ramses, Ramses. Um, so this is the Darpur battle scene. Um, another line drawing here, Ramses again. Um, personally, you know, doing it all. Bless him. Um, this is the battle scene here. You can see scaling ladders going on. The fortress gates there. The defenders chucking people off the battlements. Bows and arrows, people, the Egyptian army down there. Um, you've actually got one of Ramses' sons here with his forelock of youth um, having a go. And then 
just here in this picture here this bit here they're having a barbecue there's buns there's beef and there are the two bottles of wine um so what's going on here right in the middle of this battle there's the the prince there just about to smite an enemy we're having brekkies well uh, apparently they think that this is the overseer of Dapur with his wife and two daughters bringing offerings out to Ramses in the hope of saving his life and this is the scene itself so do you see buns the beef and um, the overseer there and the bottles of wine so um, quite quite a an odd scene right in the middle of this battle scene I used to wonder for ages whether it was actually a late inscription until I did a bit more research. Now, that all backs on to the Hyperstar Hall. Um, and the Hyperstar Hall would have been roofed and it would have had walls. Um, and the only light would have come from clear story windows in the um, roof. Now, the, the way it works is that the roof is, is sort of, um, uh, it's higher here and lower here, so that the, the side bit of the roof coming down here has these windows in it, which would have let in the light. Um, it's a, a really a, in, in quite decent condition compared to the one at Medinay Habu. Now, I said to you, uh, you know, think about the first two courts of Habu and add on the Hyperstar Hall of the Ramesseum and you've got a, a full temple. So this is the Hall of the Ramesseum. And very, very, very beautifully decorated it is. Lots of colour here. Um, I really like that turquoise. It does look so good. And they did a clean of it about... Um, about three or four years ago so it's it's really looking quite nice and here is one of the um, windows this is in the second part of the hyperstyle hall and that would have let the sunlight in and it, it would have been a bit sort of you know like spotlights highlighting the color um, and with the white backgrounds and everything reflecting off the light it would have been quite amazing inside these places so the hyperstar hall is supposed to make you feel small and insignificant and it certainly does that because it's huge and you're supposed to feel you're in the house of the god oh my god he's so wonderful he's so great and i'm so tiny and so insignificant and that is what you're supposed to really feel as you get closer and closer to the sanctuary now you notice you're going further and further uphill looking back towards the first pylon you can see that it goes down quite a way um, and behind us we're, we're still going uphill and we're going down as well the first pylon is much higher than this hyperstar hall so we're getting to our smallest darkest place in the sanctuary now just before you go out of the Hyperstar Hall, you will see some graffiti. Now, there is a lot of graffiti on ancient Egyptian walls. This does not mean you are supposed to add to it. Graffiti is interesting and instructive, but it doesn't need any additions. So don't you ever dare put anything on those walls. Um, so what we've got here is some people, Bells only. Geddes, Hetley, Bonifils, Salt, and we've also got a Coptic cross there as well. So who are all these people? Well, Belzoni, um, Giovanni Belzoni, was an Italian circus strongman, and you can get a really good book um, on Belzoni, which is very, very interesting to read. And um, the stuff he did in Egypt was quite amazing. Um, if you've been to the pyramids down in Egypt, the entrance you would have gone in is the one that Giovanni made. Um, the tomb of I, that's Giovanni's. 
he could look at the side of a mountain and say, that looks a bit odd, dig there, and he'd find a tomb. So his contribution to Egyptology is immense. Now, if you go into the British Museum, um, you look at the papyrus, you will see the Salt Papyrus. And the British consul, Henry Salt, bought a lot of things and sent it to uh, the British Museum. So uh, the contents of the British Museum, um, what was Belzonian and Salt, you know, we couldn't have done without them, we wouldn't have anything in there. Uh, the French, uh, he was a photographer, very, very well known, um, worth looking up his photos. I don't know who these other two are, and wouldn't it be fun to find out? Now, um, if you go round looking all the graffiti up there of all these uh, 1800s people, and uh, early 1900s people, you know, who are they? Why were they in Egypt? What's their purpose? Why did they have enough money? Um, did they bring anything back? Have they got a stately home where there might be some antiquities there? Uh, it's quite an area of exploration. Um, also, the height of graffiti tells you, tells you the level of debris at the time that they were visiting. So the fact that the uh, graffiti is way away up in the walls is because there was so much debris at the time that that was the natural height to write at. Going through past our graffiti, we get to the small hyperstar hall, um, which has an astronomical ceiling. So if you look up, another trick in the neck time, you will see um, a sort of like, uh, astrology, astronomy kind of symbols on the ceiling. Um, on the back wall we've got a number of sacred barks. Now each of the heads of the sacred barks is different and by the head you can identify the god that would have been in the shrine on that sacred bark. So if we have a female head with a double crown it's not. If we have a falcon head with a moon and a moon crescent, it's Honsu. If we have a ram's head, it's Armand, etc. etc. Um, also in this area, we've got the king under the sacred tree of Heliopolis with Artem, Shetha and Thoth. And um, because of this sort of nature of the, the um, carvings and uh, um, pictures, that are around there. They think that this might have been a library area because um, of the writing. You see, here we have Artem. You see, he's got a pen in his hand. And we've got Sheshat, and she's also got a, a pen in her hand. And Thoth is here, but the, the columns are there, so you can't actually get far enough back with my camera to get all three of them in. And Ramses is sitting in the middle there, and they are writing his name on little clay tablets and putting them in the tree of life. And he hopes to reign for as many years as there are trees, uh, leaves on the tree of life. Sheshat there, um, I call her the goddess of quantity for swaying. Um, do, do you see as well as the pen she's got in her hand, she has a notched palm rib. And um, she counts things, she measures things. She's often used at temples when the king is laying out the temple, saying it's going to be X cubits by Y cubits. She's there helping him. So she, she's she got a sort of like a star symbol on her head. It's a sort of pointy star there. So that's how you know Shesha. This is one of the barks. Now here you can see that it's a female head with a double crown. So in that shrine there would have been mut. And we have the priests carrying it along and they would have rested it on altars when they got to their destination. There's quite a few of them on the back wall there. Um, and this is the view out of the library towards the sanctuary. Um, now it should have been completely closed. Um, and this would have been our smallest, darkest place. You see how the floor is going up a bit and the ceiling level is going down. But instead, we've got the view of the Theban Hills going out the back there. 
So um, this particular sanctuary has got some Christian graffiti in it because it was used by Christians later um, in the life of Egypt. But this would have been the, where the bark of the god would have been placed on an altar and he would have had offerings made to him he would have been um washed and dressed in the morning and had incense burnt to him he uh, rich clothing and all those magazine storage areas around the ramesseum would have had everything he needed to make sure these offerings could take place now they should be done by pharaoh but a priest can deputize for pharaoh but he would be doing it saying, I'm here on Pharaoh's behalf, kind of thing. Now, the magazine storage areas around are quite interesting because they are round, but there is no keystone. And an Egyptian architect called Hassan Fassi saw the Ramesseum and the mud brick and this inspired him to come up with his idea of architecture for the poor. And if you search on Hassan Fati and architecture for the poor, you'll find a lot of stuff about him. And he wrote a book which you can get hold of. And he talks about how you can build domes and wind catchers and take advantage of um, techniques that have been in Egypt forever. And the building material, mud brick. Um, the magazines are absolutely extensive. They're huge. There's masses of them. And it just shows how rich this temple was. And how it must have been endowed with a lot of land to support it. But the keystone. How does it work? How can you have a round top without a keystone? Well... Can you see here that it's sloping back? It, it's not straight, it's got a slope to it. So in fact, the stresses are being taken on that back wall there. So that's how they got away with building an arch without a keystone. Because it, it goes back, it falls back on that back wall to um, support it. Um, quite interesting, isn't it? Um, and to see them still there, you know, after 3,000 years, you can see why Hassan Fassi thought, well, that's quite a good way of building. Now, next door to the Ramesseum is the Ramesseum Cafe. And you may have heard of a family called the Abdul Rasul family. And this cafe is run by the Abdul Rasul. And the Abdul Rasuls were the family that were responsible for TT320 or DB320, TT Theban Tomb, DB Daryl Barre. Um, and this tomb they found as a family um, and they sort of used it as their bank and they sold off bits and pieces. And then the father died and the two brothers fell out. And one of the two brothers reported it to the authorities. And they got in there and they found all these royal bodies, mummies. And most of the contents of the mummy room at the Cairo Museum are from this tomb. Now, one of the most important things in Egyptology happened. They cleared it in record time and they didn't take any photographs. So um, identification of some of these mummies is a little suspect because they were in the wrong coffins, they were wrongly labelled because they, they'd been stripped um, by robbers way, way back and re-wrapped and reburied in this tomb um, in the late period. So we're not, you can't really be sure that any of them are who they are, say they are except for Ua and Fue and Tutankhamun, because they're the only ones that were found in their tombs. Everybody else is a little suspect. But, um, uh, yeah, if you go into the mummy room at the Cairo Museum, you'll see the contents of TT320. Um, now, the Abdul Rasul have another claim to fame. Uh, in uh, the book 
that Howard Carter wrote on St. Carmen. There is a very, very famous photo of a young boy, local boy, um, wearing the petrol of Tutankhamun. And this is the father of the current owner of the cafe. And on the walls of the cafe, they have a photos of him as an old man holding the photo of himself as a young boy wearing Tutankhamun's petrol. So it's a, quite an interesting local place to visit and uh, get a picture of uh, the, the, the more modern history of Luxor and what went on with the families, the local families here. It does have another advantage, icy cold beer. And if you've been dragging around all these tombs and temples with me, you might be ready for one by now. So I hope you've enjoyed our Ramseum module. Um, the next one is Seti the First, which is his father. So what I've done is, is go to grandson and then father, and now I'm going to grandfather and showing you the temples as we're going along. So you'll see the difference um, not in the design of the temple, but in the decoration of the temple when we go on to 31.